So let's officially open this first session of our Beauvoir webinar series. Um, on behalf of the International Simone de Beauvoir Society, welcome everyone and uh, thank you for being with us today. Um, special thanks to our Asian friends because it is very late for them. Uh, it's been a challenge to manage the different time zones um, ever since we began this project because it gathers um, people from all over the world, which is very nice. Um, I want to mention that um, we are recording the event and we are also live on Facebook. Uh, by the way, you can visit our Facebook page and share the stream uh, so that people can hear uh, the conversation that is going to follow. And uh, the recording will be then uh, posted on the YouTube channel of the Society. So uh, please make sure you are uh, muted during the session to facilitate and uh, um, the, the recording and the communication, but you should feel free to write in the, in the chat box. For those who are not familiar with the Beauvoir webinar series, um, I will just say a few words. Um, it was a project that was conceived out of the interest um, of, of Beauvoir scholars from the society, especially my friend Gina Opiniano, who had this wonderful idea that aims at making present and heard the continuous discourse on Beauvoir. And um, her idea joined the aspirations of other members of the society, such as Mary Altman and Crescent Melly Mason, our president, for example. Um, we already had um, two sessions, which gathered a lot of people. Judith Coffin, uh, during the first session, talked about a Beauvoir ecosystem I don't know if you remember, Judy. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful image <laughs> because it translates well the objective of the International Simone de Beauvoir Society, which is to create and uh, consolidate a community around Beauvoir. And many of you told us uh, that these sessions are a breath of fresh air because they allow you and us to come together uh, virtually in these challenging times. Uh, that's why at the Society, we are all glad that these sessions have become uh, valuable and unmissable events for, for all of you. But if you did miss the first two sessions, don't, uh, don't panic. You can watch or listen to them on YouTube. Uh, some of you might not be familiar with, at all with Beauvoir. And we played a short video of her life at the beginning of the first session, and it is now on YouTube too. So uh, feel free to watch and share if you're interested. Um, I'll give you the links in the chat box in a moment, but you can refer to the website of the society on which you'll be able to find all the information related to the series, but also to the society's activities to the journals, Simone de Beauvoir Studies, and to other Beauvoir-related events, books, um, et cetera. And on this website, you can also become a member of the society and to be part of this uh, great community. Uh, now about uh, today's session. Um, it will be a discussion between Meryl Altman, Sonia Crooks, and Judith Coffin, based on Meryl Altman's book, Beauvoir in Time, which was published in uh, 2020. Uh, we will then take questions from the audience, but you should feel free to ask them all along the conversation. It's best if you write your question in the chat box, in fact, so that we can keep track of all, all of them. And uh, the conversation will be followed and concluded by Gina Opiniano's response um, and conclusion. Um, just a quick information um, about the book, the editor generously offered a discount code. So if you have not purchased uh, the, the book yet, make sure you use the code that you see on the, on the screen. Um, now let me properly introduce the author and her book. We are of course delighted to welcome Mary Altman. Um, she uh, studied literature at Swarthmore in Colombia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. And she taught at Dupuy University in Indiana. She has published on modernist American poetry and fiction. She has published also on the history of sexuality, Sappho and classical reception, migrant domestic labor, and Beauvoir. Uh, Meryl is a longtime member of the society and she's currently secretary treasurer of the society. She has written a large number of articles on Beauvoir and feminist theory, and she just published the book that we are gathered today uh, to talk about. 
Um, I read the book with great interest and uh, admiration. For those who have not uh, yet seen the book, I most quickly described it physically uh, to give an idea of, it, of its scope. It's a very large book, almost 600 pages long, filled with references and details that are extremely valuable for anyone interested in Beauvoir and her thought. It brings into dialogue works that have been produced over decades of research in Beauvoir studies. And in this book, Meryl proposes to explore the themes that are today the most sensitive and controversial when it comes to talking about Beauvoir. Um, I'm thinking in particular of uh, racism or classism um, and on, on the way Beauvoir describes women's sexuality. And these subjects are sensitive precisely because we read Beauvoir today with our current frames of thought, which means that we extract her from her own context of thinking, of life, of writing. Uh, this certainly proves that Beauvoir is still an emblematic figure that, and that there is something at stake in claiming or refusing her legacy. But a work of contextualization was necessary and Meryl did it. And that's where Mary's approach is important. And uh, um, I personally see this book as a tool to put in everyone's hands and it will remain on my desk for a long time uh, as a guide through my own writing. And I won't expand too much because I want to let our guests speak um, about it. Um, Meryl, would you like to say something before I introduce Sonia and Judy? I'll just say thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, and I'm really, it's 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 wonderful to see people and and uh, yes, thank you. And I'll speak later. <laughs> okay. Um, to talk with uh, Meryl. Oh, sorry. Um, about her book, we are delighted to welcome uh, two special guests: a philosopher and a historian whose work we all admire. I'm sure, and it is a great honor to welcome them today as well. Uh, Sonia Crooks is a political philosopher currently at Oberlin College USA. She is best known uh, for her scholarly work on the political and social ideas of the French existentialists. Uh, she has also published extensively on feminist theory, and she's a longtime specialist of Simone de Beauvoir and has uh, published groundbreaking books and articles on Beauvoir. And two of her books uh, are on screen. So welcome, uh, Sonia. Um, and Judy, um, Judith Coffin is an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Texas at Austin, where she specializes in European social and cultural history, especially 20th century France. She's a specialist in gender, sexuality, and the history of feminism and the history of radio, which is her current research, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, uh, she recently published a book titled Sex, Love and Letters, writing Simone de Beauvoir. And the first session of the Beauvoir webinar series was about those letters. And I had the pleasure to have a conversation with Judy about the, her book. So welcome again, um, Judy. Um, Sonia and then Judy <coughs> are going to comment on Meryl's book and Meryl will then respond to them. Uh, the three of you have 45 minutes to one hour, and then you can answer the question from the audience during 30 minutes. So I am now ending over to Sonia. Thank you. Okay, well, let me start. Well, let me start by saying, can you hear me as I'm speaking? Yes, okay. Yes. Uh, all right, good. Well, first of all, I mean, thanks. And um, uh, thanks to Gina for enabling all this to happen technically and to, and to Marine also for helping to set up the whole series and this particular one. Um, and then thanks to Meryl um, for I think an absolutely unique and wonderful book. Um, as Marine has said, um, it's a work of scholarship that we probably will all want to have on our desks for a very long time. It's incredibly detailed in its research. Um, the scholarship is immaculate. Um, Everything that Beauvoir is cited is given to us in English and in French, which is tremendously useful. Um, and it's got very many original insights and arguments um, as you go through it. Um, but in addition, I think one must say it's a remarkably readable book. 
it is not a dry a dry <laughs> scholastic tome it's very personally written uh, it's very conversational in tone there are many anecdotes uh Meryl draws on her own experiences and and there's a lot of humor in it so generally rather dry humor um so it's a it's a good read as well as a necessary read okay uh, i i took two what i call two main take-home messages from the book um, about method. Um, the first is the importance of reading thinkers in their own context. Or if you like the book, I would have said um, in situation, right? And this applies both to reading Beauvoir herself and to reading later thinkers, thinkers and activists who've engaged with her often critically. So one needs to read them I think particularly in the context, most of the critics that Beauvoir, uh, Merrill is looking at, one needs to read in the context of uh, the culture wars in the US and feminism within those culture wars. Okay, um, and uh, we should not read Beauvoir anachronistically. That is as if our world and its concerns were also her world. So I think this is very important of methodological point Beauvoir is, um, sorry, Merrill is making. Uh, the second one is what I'm going to call the importance of reading generously. Okay, well, I think those of us who are, you know, in areas of, should we call it critical scholarship, I mean, philosophy, literary criticism, um, critical theory, um, you know, we're trained to take a text and pull it apart and find what's wrong in it, right? Um, and I think, you know, Merrill is saying, yes, there are things that are wrong, but Let's look, let's look more generously. Um, so that even when ideas seem misguided or outdated, we should search for why they might have been said, why they might have made sense then, and what value they might still have for us now. There's an idiomatic phrase which is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right? You <laughs> keep keep focus looking for what is good there. And I thought I'd read you just a very short passage actually from the End of, towards the end of the book, where I think Meryl kind of makes this clear. She asks, um, she asks, what would happen if we read dated feminist works, and she has dated in inverted commas, not with the hermeneutics of disapproval, but with an eye to possible alliances and collaborations? What chosen projects might we then discover that we and they actually share? What if the datedness of old works became not a reason to dismiss them, but to learn? And to teach more history. Okay, and I think that very well encapsulates what Merrill is about in this book. Um, but of course, Merrill, uh, sorry, Beauvoir often is dated now. Um, and she was writing, as Merrill importantly says in the introduction, uh, she uses this phrase, Beauvoir was writing before we said we. And of course, that we refers to we of a feminist movement that developed long after Beauvoir was writing. Um, and so also before the, all the difficult questions about who belongs in that we and who who's excluded from that we, right? So be before all of that is when Beauvoir was writing, before we said we. And quite a bit of what she wrote now seems not only out of date, but embarrassing. It says Merrill, sometimes it's enough, it's enough to make one blush. We wish she hadn't said that. Um, and Merrill echoes the voice of many of Beauvoir's critics when she says, uh, we wouldn't say that now. There are many things we look at and we say, oh, we wouldn't say that now. Um, and it's, in price, it's precisely, I think, as Marine already said, these very embarrassing things that we wouldn't say now that are the explicit focus of Merrill's book. Um, and she wants to focus her reading of Beauvoir through this um, to, as she says, not to defend or excuse Beauvoir, but to understand what she was doing then uh, and to show how she is still good to think with now. And I think that distinction, what was then and good to think with now is, is very important. Um, okay, another, the book was published very recently. I, sadly, it's also very expensive, I think even with the discount. Um, so I am assuming that not many of you have actually gotten hold of a copy and managed to read it yet. Um, so I'm going to uh, summarize its contents a little more fully than Marine did go over actually what's in the book, right? And, and then um, I'm going to end by talking about a couple of specific issues 
book raises that I think are the important ones now. So what is good to think about now using Beauvoir will be where I end up. Uh, so let me just quickly overview the contents. Um, so the introduction is indeed titled Before We Said We, right? uh, and it's followed by six chapters. And the first two chapters deal with matters of sexuality. Uh, chapter one, Unhappy Bodies, discusses the treatment of women's sexual experience in the second sex, particularly the whole question of uh, frigidity and a, a lot of research there on Stakel, who was the main source that Beauvoir used. And I have to say, I have never read, and I can't imagine a great many of us have actually gone off and read Stakel. Um, and this is the kind of scholarship Meryl does that she has, and she discusses how Stakel is being used and also why Stakel is used because there really weren't a great many other resources around. Okay. And then the second of those chapters is on lesbian lived experience. And Mero suggests um, that there are ways of reading what's very, what's often regarded as very problematic in Beauvoir's treatment of lesbianism as perhaps less, less problematic. After that, um, the book really turns to questions about, um, about a race and class. Um, the third chapter is called Nothing to Say About Race and Class? Question mark, um, and suggests that Beauvoir has a great deal to say on these topics, but not in the ways that later feminists expected that she should have. So this question about reading in context, the misreading out of context comes up here. Uh, Beauvoir and Blackness, the fourth chapter, further takes up the question of race and the context in which Beauvoir was thinking about it. It's a lot of discussion here of um, her relationship with Richard Wright, African-American, right? And also, interestingly, um, French surrealism as a context for what Beauvoir is thinking, um, and it's, some of it's linking to the negritude movement. The fifth chapter is called The East is Real, Orientalism and Its Enemies. And it discusses what Beauvoir has to say about the East, um, addresses the concept of Orientalism and the accusations based on some indeed embarrassing and unfortunate passages in Beauvoir um, that she has Orientalist, um, ori orientalist orientation. Um, anyhow, um, but what, Bo what Meryl wants to do is to essentially reject claims that they're sufficient to make us reject Beauvoir and to dismiss her as an Orientalist. Okay, and the final chapter um, is called Beauvoir in China. And it discusses Beauvoir's rather little-known book on China, The Long March, which was published in 1957. And here, Merrill further complicates the question of Orientalism, noting that Beauvoir's critiques of traditional Chinese society are also those made by both nationalist and communist Chinese movements. And so it's very hard to say that there are Western Orient Orientalist view of China. Um, and it considers how, in the context of Cold War hostility, to China, Beauvoir emphasized especially the material benefits that were being brought to the mass of the population. And also how her work has traveled and altered in meaning in China more recently. And indeed, some recent Chinese feminists have made of Beauvoir a theorist of essential sexual difference, which probably Beauvoir would have been horrified about, but it's a, it's a sense sort of the plasticity of work, the way that it can change meaning and be read, read in different ways. Okay, so that's a very, very quick oversimplified summary of what you get in the different chapters. Um, and to sum up more broadly, I think each chapter does three things. Okay, each tries to make sense of what Beauvoir says then, in her time, by looking at um, Meryl uses a very nice metaphor of downstream. So um, what Beauvoir says then by looking downstream at her intellectual resources and also at her available empirical evidence. And one of the points Beauvoir made, sorry, I keep bugging the two of you up, Meryl. One of the points that uh, Meryl made about Beauvoir <laughs> is that she is very empirical in orientation. She always wanted factual data to back up what she was saying. Um, and I think, as we know, a lot of what she got was dubious data um, and all kinds of different sources of data that she sort of clusters together, right? But but the sort of attempt to actually find out, to get to get at the facts, I think is, is a very important part of Beauvoir's project and one to be 
appreciated, even if we don't think she always gets the facts right. Um, so so the, each chapter is looking downstream at the sort of intellectual and empirical resources, in the, the milieu in which Beauvoir was writing, and then upstream, so beyond Beauvoir, uh, to discuss the later thinkers um, who have engaged with her, often taking her out of context. And then thirdly, to ask what of Beauvoir's might, work might still be of value for us now. Um, however, this third project, the idea that Beauvoir is good to think with now, is intimated and sort of hinted at rather than very fully set out in each chapter, I think probably wisely, because those are the places of open discussion. Right, but I'm going to um, turn now for, as a sort of last section of my comments to uh, suggest a couple of issues that I think the book raises for us now. Um, and I'll just say what the two are and then talk about them briefly. Okay, uh, the first is Merrill's insistence that Beauvoir was always a woman of the left. And the second is a claim that Beauvoir was attentive to intersectionality and the two are linked. Okay. Um, Merrill claims and documents how throughout her life, Beauvoir was a woman of the left. Um, and this comes up particularly to start with in the chapter, nothing to say about race and class, which is, has a lot on race about it, but also a lot about class. Um, Merrill shows that, but not only in the second sex before and after throughout her life, Beauvoir's central concerns were always about colonialism and class exploitation and oppression. And she also shows that a Marxist informed orientation to material conditions and to economic relationships shaped Beauvoir's entire intellectual and political worldview. Okay, and I don't want to go into this in length, but Beauvoir's Marxism is clearly not the Marxism of the mainstream Communist Party, and it's often very quietly, I think, folded into the way she talks about, for example, the way economic dependency is linked to property relations when she goes through the history section of the second sex. Okay. Um, and in the second sex itself, I think, again, this orientation, this Marxist orientation, materialist orientation is there very, very strongly. And I think Merrill pulls it out in interesting ways. Um, or was critique of women's complicity in their oppression. She sort of talks about that a lot. It's clearly focused on bourgeois women and it's their economic dependency on men, their material needs that often induces them to comply. This is not the only reason for complicity, but it's a very important one. Uh, Beauvoir is also very finely attuned to the different oppressions of working women, and not only in that little chapter in historical materialism, um, but it, it runs through the book and Merrill picks up other places, uh, the whole treatment of prostitution, for example, um, talks about the way that it's, it's, it's often the only, only means of survival for, for working class women. Right, so there's a strong class component there. And likewise, the discussion of abortion talks about abortion as a class crime because poor women have illegal backstreet abortions and wealthy women can afford to go overseas and get abortions that are safe. Okay, and the same materialist orientation suffuses, I think, uh, Beauvoir's later works um, and, and activities as support of the Algerian struggle and the book on China, for example, also her book on old age, which Merrill does not discuss here, um, talks a lot about the way that a capitalist economy basically throws people out on the scrap heap, scrap heap at the end of a working life. Okay, so one of the ways Beauvoir is good to think with now concerns the focus on the materiality of oppression. And I think there's been a feminist tendency to look more at cultural and affective or emotional aspects of oppression in recent years. But reading Beauvoir through Merrill's lenses reminds us we should not forget about class exploitation and that the persistence of unfulfilled basic needs um, has not gone away and maybe needs to be more of a focus of feminist concern again. Okay, and this leads me to my second and final point, which is to think of thinking about Beauvoir as an intersectional thinker. Um, and again, this flies in the face of general thinking about Beauvoir. You know, she's often dismissed as this white middle class and, well, mostly heterosexual woman who's inattentive to differences of race, class, and gender. Um, and what Merrill suggests that I think is interesting and important is intersectionally, 
is very intersectionality is very present in Beauvoir's work, um, but it has a different, a more materialist resonance to it. Um, so if we think with Beauvoir, we should not see intersectionality necessarily as about inclusion. It's not only always, always about addressing excluded or marginalized identities. It's not necessarily about who speaks or who can come to voice, because much more than multiculturalism is involved, oppression is much more than a cultural matter. And this is not to say that it is not a cultural matter, but it's much more than that, right? And so we should also think about intersectionality in terms of relations of material ex exploitation and domination. Okay, and it also follows um, that, that there are what one might call objective differences between, between groups of people that cannot be smoothed away by, if you like, better intersectional analysis. So when Beauvoir says in the second sex that women do not say we, because divergent interests of class and race divide them. Merrill argues that she is in fact offering an intersectional anal analysis, um, but it's one that actually points us to conflicts rather than to ways of overcoming them. Um, because what Beauvoir also says that um, we need to resist demands for purity of action. That is to say there can be valid demands made that actually are in conflict and can't all be brought together. Okay, and I'm going to finish by just actually reading again a little passage from Merrill. Um, you've heard the last word here. I think she'll have some more words in a few minutes. Um, but she writes, um, commenting on Beauvoir's intersectionality. If we wait for the perfectly intersectional action, we will wait forever. Plus, in the real world, certain desiderata are genuinely incompatible and nothing is gained by pretending otherwise. Okay, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Sonia. Um, maybe we can hear Judy and then Meryl can respond to the both of you. We, we can't hear you, Judy. Hang on, here I am, <laughs> here I am, all right. Hold on just a uh, just a second, uh, just a second here. I'll try to uh, I'll try to be relatively short because there are lots of great people in the audience and and we're also eager to hear from um, Meryl. but um, but let me start by saying um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to everybody uh, everybody who's out there from Manila to uh, to New York and uh, Toulouse. It's really a pleasure to be back with the Beauvoir seminar. And thank you, Gina and Maureen for, um, for starting this project, for sustaining it, and, uh, and for inviting all of us to have these uh, conversations. And thank you to Meryl for writing this wonderful book. And I'm really glad that it came out after mine because otherwise it would have completely derailed me. I would have had to go back and do so much more, more work to try to uh, try to keep up. Um, we have, Meryl and I have very different archives, but many of the same questions. So, uh, so I love this book and let me count the ways and explain why I think uh, you all should uh, read it. Um, First of all, as, uh, as Sonia said, it's inviting, it's plain spoken, it's straightforward. The autobiographical snippets are wonderful. Merrill describes reading it in graduate, reading the second sex in graduate uh, school, raging at it and coming back to it in a way that's kind of a, a, a microcosm of her whole, uh, her whole book. Um, she, gently makes fun of current debates. She wonders why everybody has to ask, was Beauvoir a lesbian? And says, and I quote, the world is divided into people for whom the question has a simple one word answer and those for whom it does not. Beauvoir is in the latter. And there's that kind of plain spoken uh, humor throughout the book. It's helpful. There are all kinds of notes on how to, uh, on how to teach the second sex, how not to excerpt it. 
it's not simply the question of translations and the bad partially translation. Um, she goes over the ways in which it has been, um, the passages that have been uh, been deleted, the way the second sex and, and other uh, other um, works by Beauvoir have, uh, have, have really been bowdlerized as they travel around the world. And she emphasizes usefully, I think, how selective our reading, anthologizing, and critique has been, how quick we are to accept critiques without going back either to that critique or to the original text. Uh, the book is irreverent, iconoclastic, and in parts like Sonia, I think it's just wickedly funny. And that's not always a specialty of the scholarship on Simone de Beauvoir. So it really is a breath uh, of fresh air. Um, Merrill starts hilariously, I think, with the things that people find, quote, embarrassing about Simone de Beauvoir. Not only the things that are controversial, as Merrill uh, said, but these things that just make us squirm, um, the many references to the frigid woman, um, the discussion of lesbianism as a stage in development, the unsympathetic women figures, the praying mantis, and of course, the eye-popping passage on um, female sexual arousal as, quote, the soft throbbing of a mollusk. No one does more than Merrill Altman to unpack the fruitful weirdness of the second sex, the odd associations in it, the interesting and incongruous intertexts, and to explain why those weirdnesses warrant discussion. She's also undogmatic, and Sonia mentioned this as well, and, and I think that may be one of her more important theoretical contributions. She doesn't get into, she doesn't wade into contests about who had what idea first, which is often an issue in discussions of Beauvoir and Fanon, for instance. She's not in the business of pitting one thinker against another or assessing the inadequacies of different theoretical stances. She doesn't think that the history of feminist thought is a long history of progress and that what we now demand is the best and certainly not the only way of dealing with naughty problems that recur through feminine feminism's history. Um, and there are many examples of those. She's deliberately and winningly modest. I quote, what do we want from theory anyhow? Perhaps the richest and most enduring theories are those that far from legislating a single outcome for a single moment in time and space, make it possible to think more than one thing in more than one way. A true and important thing will be thought more than once and by more than one very smart person. These are things that it's really, uh, that it's really helpful to be told. Um, okay, um, I come at this as an historian and perhaps predictably, I love uh, historicizing. Uh, it seems to me that Merrill really and finally puts to rest the commonplace that Beauvoir was ahead of her time. Right? People are always of their time. People are always of a moment, but what difference does that make? Um, the idea isn't to let them off the hook, to excuse what we find um, upsetting or wrongheaded. It's, at least this is a historian's perspective, it's to underscore the differences between then and now, to push back against notions of progress, to defamiliarize, to look anew at conversations in historical moments. And for me, the end is, or the point of this, is expanding and enriching our understanding of historical period and uh, connections that were made. For Merrill, it is pushing forward our understanding of Beauvoir's work. And as she says, we have to show our students and readers full knowledge of the sources from which the authors we revere drew some of their analysis and some of their strength. I think both of us, um, both um, Merrill as a 
scholar of literature and history and philosophy and me as a historian are both interested in reconsidering the common map of feminist history since the middle of the last century. Um, I will just say how much I admire the breadth of the work and historical research. We get French history, we get American history, we get other texts that become entangled in Beauvoir's uh, work. Um, we hear about Kinsey, Mary McCarthy, Hannah Arendt, Les Temps Modernes, Présence Africaine, Fanon, Wright, Léris, Boris Vian, Surrealism, Groves, uh, Grove Press, which is really a wonderful story, Grove Press trafficked in, quote, dangerously sexy books. We get to the history of Haiti, we get the history of, of Vietnam. To plunge with Merrill into the second sex and Beauvoir's other work is to plunge into an international intellectual, cultural, and political world. Um, chapter four, for instance, sets Beauvoir between Richard Wright and Frantz Fanon. Merrill's version of that situating is vastly broader than any other that I have read. It reconstructs the cross-pollinations, the borrowings, appropriations, and inspirations. Merrill doesn't simply nod to Michel Leris, the surrealist and ethnographer whom Beauvoir so admired. She traces Leris's intellectual and political development, how he begins fascinated with the racialized other as a mirror of the self, becomes increasingly troubled by that position, and how ethnography is implicated in colonialism and emerges as an engaged thinker and spokesperson who's sort of struggling for notions of reciprocity or allyship, I suppose we would call it, and responsibility. We then get a similarly multidimensional portrait of Richard Wright. Um, Merrill casts a critical eye on the New York intellectuals who condescended to Wright and to Beauvoir. She underscores their Cold War politics, the place of the Cold War and, um, and anti-communism in the separate development of American and European feminisms. And at the end of this chapter, we get to the deep affinities or shared visions of Fanon and Beauvoir, the psychological scars of racism and sexism, the existential understanding of race and gender. It is a long chapter. I will say that, Meryl, it is 110 pages, but I finished it yesterday afternoon with a real sense of, wow, I have gotten stuff from this conversation. You know, I've read a lot of stuff on Wright, Fennel, and Beauvoir, and there is, there is nothing, uh, nothing like this. Um, let me make one uh, last point. It's, it, Sonia already made it, but um, I think it deserves to be made. In, uh, in this book, the method is the argument. And there are a couple of pieces of that. And I've, and I've laid them out in a, in a kind of, this is what you must do, um, imitating a little bit um, Merrill's style. Um, you have to read the book. You have to read Beauvoir. You have to read The Second Sex. As Merrill says, quote, People seem to attribute a profound, even life-changing significance to Simone de Beauvoir, even when they have not read a word she wrote. Uh, that is absolutely true. And Marine and I know exactly how, uh, how true that is, how many of uh, Beauvoir's readers, in fact, read uh, nothing more than magazine articles about her. Okay, Merrill's point number two, you not only have to re read it, you have to be a reader, not a fan. You have to read it all. Beauvoir put so much into the second sex because she wanted to open up different ways of seeing the world. She didn't want to make definitive statements, but to explore ambiguities and situations in a way that to quote Merrill, quote, a, tight, a tighter framework might foreclose. <clears throat> Thing three, when you balk at passages in the second sex, and we all do, ask why. Where do those odd citations come from? What's the source of that jarring language? You have to follow up on the moments of opacity and weirdness. Don't set them aside. 
That's Meryl's method. And rather like Beauvoir, she doesn't want to leave anything out. She re reconstructs so many of the conversations in which Beauvoir is embroiled and the many problems she's trying to <clears throat> address. She wants to uncover what feminism is about, has been about, and the many things it has been about. You have to cast a wide net. She wants us to read Beauvoir alongside um, what she nicely describes as more si suspect discourses with which readers sometimes confuse them. Trashy sex novels, bad novels with romance plots, outmoded psychoanalytic and sex sexological uh, authorities. Um, there is the example of, um, of Steckel, Wilhelm Steckel, the renegade Freudian and author of many books, uh, famously in the second sex, uh, Frigidity in Women, 1926. Why, Merrill asks, does Beauvoir cite him so much? Well, it's partly because she is scouring the extant literature for accounts of women's sexual subjectivity. And she finds those in literature, in diaries, <clears throat> in social science, and in sexology. Um, Steckel was pretty nutty. Um, he also, was also a misogynist. But the term frigidity rocketed across European and American popular culture. It was an accusation women's tangled psyches and sexual shortcomings were their fault. But it also, as she points out, named an unhappiness. And among other things, 1970s feminism was a discourse of women's dissatisfaction with their situation. One that included labeling and cataloging sexual dissatisfaction. And that labeling happened in novels, in films, as much as in theory. There's another very important point here, um, very resonant for a historian, but one I think that, um, that Merrill um, also considers uh, very significant because she says it on several occasions. Feminist discourse or feminist theory or feminist conversation is part of a larger discursive world. And feminism has always had, I'm, I'm basically paraphrasing Merrill, has always had a complex and uneasy relationship with other culturally available discourses on gender and sexuality. Those are biological, they are religious, they are psychoanalytic and so on and so on. So feminism overlaps <clears throat> in ways that are troubling, politically ambiguous and inevitable with discourses that were not feminist and some that came to be seen as anti-feminist. That I think is one of the most uh, important takeaway points. Um, and that is one of the reasons why Merrill argues so, um, so compellingly that the search for purism, purity, um, for purging the, um, un, the, the unhappy parts of, uh, of current discourse is, uh, is, perhaps a, uh, is perhaps a mistake. <clears throat> okay, there's one, uh, there's one last point. Uh, Merrill asks, what, what do we do with the second sex? What's the book's relationship to feminism. Michel Ledoff once called The Second Sex a self-consciously post-feminist book. And how, Merrill asks, did it inspire a feminist movement? My answer to that, and this may be the only point where uh, Merrill and I disagree, is that it didn't inspire it and that we can let go of Beauvoir, mother of feminism, right? We can also let go of the notion that the second sex comes out of a not yet feminist space. There was plenty of feminism in 1948 and in the 1950s and in the 1960s. Beauvoir just didn't want anything to do with it because of her 
um, various actually intersectional and, uh, and, and Marxist, uh, Marxist commitments. Now that doesn't mean that feminists haven't gone back and recovered her and, and, and put her at the center of the canon. Um, the reach of Beauvoir's work is extraordinary. She grabbed hold of countless readers. That's partly because of her capacious existentialism and partly as Merrill shows her ability to capture so many different situations. Um, that's meant that she can be read and reread in different moments. Anyway, this book is an extraordinarily broad canvas that not only helps us to see Beauvoir differently, but to point to different impulses, overlapping insights and different historical moments. And Merrill has helped historicize the way that feminist solidarities emerge and dissipate in history and to pluralize feminism as a movement as well as theory. So thank you. We, I, have, I have questions, but um, we can come back to, to those later. So thank you all. Thank you, Sonia and Judy, for your insightful comments. Uh, I'm sure Meryl has a lot to say uh, uh, about them. Well, again, uh, really what I most want to say is, is thanks. Um, I'm impressed that both of you were able to summarize this book, uh, a thing that uh, I would be completely unable to do myself at this, <laughs> at this point. Um, and and I, I very much appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the generosity of, of these comments. Um, I'll just say a, a few things that maybe will help people who haven't seen the book um, know about it. Um, so it's, um, it's too expensive and it's also very long. <laughs> um, and and I, I should say that, that despite the fact that it is so expensive and really priced for libraries, uh, I'm very grateful to Brill for having been willing to publish the book I actually wrote, as opposed to suggesting that I put it on a diet and come out with something more ordinary in size and, and, and scope. Um, the, the, uh, I see a, a few people who, who know me from my job and uh, the, the um, there, there used to be a joke that what would, what it would say on my tombstone should be, she assigned too much reading. Um, and, and, and that that would be fair. And um, as, as both Judy and Sonia uh, have said, you know, the book assigns too much reading. I, I uh, um, but I, I will say, so uh, it goes down a lot of, I go down a lot of rabbit holes um, a lot of rabbit holes. Uh, and uh, in some cases, um, you may end up feeling um, that I read something so that you don't have to, <laughs> because, you know, many of the, you know, I, I'm not recommending Steckel, really. Uh, I'm not recommending Boris Fian or, or some of the, the, well, all right, we'll argue about it, about it, about it later. Um, but what, what I am arguing is that um, there's a lot more in the second sex than people think there is. Um, and uh, and, and um, it was Christine Delphi who uh, said at some conference or other, um, Simone de Beauvoir was a philosopher. She's not an interactive video game. You have to read the book. <laughs> and, and I was very, uh, 
and I think um, people who work on Fanon feel the same way. And um, yeah, and, and so, so, so as both of you have said, um, you know, it's, it's an argument for a certain kind of reading uh, more than, more than uh, that, that's, that's mostly what it turned out to be at the end. Um, and another thing that, that was interesting about the project is that because it took me so long to write, uh, because I'm the world's slowest writer, things changed over the course of the time that I was working on it. Uh, so, and things changed in Beauvoir world, in the scholarship world, as well as in you know the life world. Um, so that when I started writing it, I think there was still, um, we were still in the in the stage of a of a feminist recovery project, to some extent. Um, I, I don't know if people outside literature talk about it in that way, but um, the the idea that that the great uh, the same thing happened with Virginia Woolf, right? I'm old enough I'm old enough to remember when people were like, "Oh, that's a minor writer," you know. Um, so there was a lot of uh, of need for people to do scholarship saying, no, she is a real, Beauvoir really is a philosopher. She really is a great philosopher. Uh, Sartre didn't have all her ideas. You shouldn't limit her to her biography. And then um, as things went on, um, we're not in that place now, right? So what do you do when the recovery project has succeeded? That's, that's something that I think it's worth it's worth people thinking about, you know, as a, as a discipline. The only thing, the only thing I, um, the only thing I, I would say that that um, that Judy and Sonia haven't mentioned that's important to me um, is interdisciplinarity. Um, you know, Beauvoir never said to herself. That's not my field. She never said that's beyond the scope of this discussion, right? Um, if there was something she didn't know, she didn't say, oh, I don't know about that. I can't talk about that. You know, she went and found some friend of hers that knew about it, or she went to the library, or, or she did those things. And the result is, um, Is is uh, the is is a lot of empirical stuff that people usually skip, right? Numbers, right? Statistics, uh, but 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 also an ability to put things together that you wouldn't see together, uh, and I think that is a real legacy to feminist scholarship and to feminist study that we need to be careful not to lose, you know? So, so um, when we say, oh, uh, well, I'm doing philosophy. I'm not interested in the literature. It, that doesn't help, you know? Um, and, and I guess the last thing I want to say about that is the, that I think Beauvoir always wrote in a spirit of intellectual curiosity. And I also did. And I think people should. <laughs> I guess that's all I want to say about it. Uh, I'd really much rather take questions if there are some in the chat. Thank you, Mary. Should we take questions from the chat or maybe Judy and Sonia have questions to ask Mary before we take questions from the audience? Judy, you said you have a question. We can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, everybody has tuned in from all over the world. So if there are questions from the audience, let's take those first. You've listened to, to Sonia and to, to 
me. I mean, we could go in if nobody has questions, but I think I see one already. Yeah, maybe Sarah Gwen Shabu would like to ask her question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi. Do you hear me? Yes. Yep. Hi. 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 So thank you very much. And I just want to say, I mean, in the beginning, I just want to say that I'm excited to be here to see you all. I, you know how much I love you and your work, Mary, Sonia. Uh, well, Judith, I, I know you less, but it's, but it was great to to okay. to see you and to listen to you. And I have like a question, which is I think which is for the three of you, and it's it's kind of a connection that I made uh, um, with your your talks, and and I hope you bear with me, and and if you can say something about it, I will be very happy, and. I mean, I, I see something in the things that you said now, calling for, a, in my view, for, for excess, like Beauvoir's calling for excess or your readings calling for excess. I saw it in the, I mean, in, in the first in the first talk with Sonia, speaking about the intersectionality, the against purity of action, which is something that Sonia wrote about in, in her book, of course, uh, you know, like the possibility of speaking not only from a pure place of not, I mean, my white bourgeois place, but the possibility of also speaking for others sometimes. How do we do it? It's like, like, like breaking these boundaries, maybe that intersectionality has maybe against what it wanted from the beginning, but, but they have, intersectionality has put these boundaries. You can only speak from your pure place. So against this, and then Judy spoke about Mary speaking about reading everything in Beauvoir, everything, not skipping places, right? Taking also the, I would say the, the trash, <laughs> like in <laughs> Marx, like, yes, not, not like, not, not, not really, like not cleaning, no, trying not to clean the text. And, and, um, and then, and, and 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 then I feel that maybe this is and, and this this large book <laughs> this Mary's large book is like this really reunion of all these things and then I feel that maybe all this is connected to something that for me it has been the most important thing for for my research on, on Beauvoir or my use on Beauvoir which is her 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 view on the body or how do we exist in the world like embodied beings and maybe in an excessive way, maybe, you know, like we are, we are with others. Our existence is not as just like individuals, but connected to others and to the world. This phenomenological part of Beauvoir that, I mean, today you didn't speak about it so much, but uh, uh, um, I wonder if you see this excess here, maybe in, in her, in her, uh, um, in her thought, and also uh, and also in your readings and your things that uh, and the things that you have done uh, with her today and, and in general, and and Mary, I love you very much and thank you for for everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's it's so great to see you too. It's it's really um, you know we're we're all looking forward to the time when we can. You know, be in the be in a be in a room together. Um, both the the people that have been involved with the society in the past, and also all these new people that I see here, and that's that's very exciting. Um, I think the you know that's so interesting to to hear you use the word excess, because I think that's right. Um, I think that's right, but when I hear that word, I associate it with, um, you know, Kristeva, and and with the, yeah, no, but with the generation of French feminists who, and and Sixou, and this this uh, kind of uh, is coming from psychoanalytic madness, um, speaking speaking the body, all of that. 
Um, and, you know, Beauvoir was very clear that that was not what she wanted, you know, um, that, well, but, that should be, but I think you're, I think you're right about something, you know, she didn't want the restrictions she didn't want the sexual restrictions. She always speaks for sexual liberation at every point, um, even if it doesn't look like um, what someone else thinks it should look like. Uh, you know, she really is against marriage, really, really is against marriage, um, for instance. Um, but I think excess on the level of meaning, the, no, you know, I mean, if, if you think about um, when, when she talks about madness um, as, a, as a feminine discourse, she's not for it, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and maybe you think it's, it's a, a limited view, but, but, but what, where I think excess is the right word is um, being in love with the universe of facts. You know, even some facts, and you know, maybe I'm projecting here. Maybe some facts that even aren't that relevant. But oh, I found this thing. I'll just put it in. You know, I think in that in that respect, yes, guilty. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. Now, as far as the problem of speaking for others, um, which is the the. Um, So a couple of things. So let me let me say how how I handled it at some points in the book, and then I'll say how she how Beauvoir handles it, which is probably more interesting. But um, you know how I handle it in the book in terms of my own positionality is that when I read what women of color have to say about Beauvoir. They say different things from each other. And then even in the Chinese situation, you know, um, Li Xiaojiang has one reading and Dai Jinhua has another reading, you know. And so um, however white I might be, I have to wade in there and think what I think about it. You know, which is not to say that it's not relevant that I'm white, but it just can't, it can't stop there, right? And there's a, there's a, there's a lot of, um, I go into a, lo a long thing about standpoint and what that is and why we need it and, and, and all of that, which you can read later. Um, but let me say something that Beauvoir says about speaking for others, um, which is, as I think you, as you probably know, in, in, uh, in The Ethics of Ambiguity, she talks about how people use not wanting to speak for others as an alibi, right? She talks about how the, um, I think it's the colonial uh, administrator will say, oh, um, you know, we can't, I, can't, I can't, you know, you know the part I'm talking about, it's about why we can't let the colonized vote, right? Or women vote. Um, and, uh, or, or the idea that, well, we can't judge for them you know, just becomes a way of backing off and being the, the what she calls the, the critical thinker or the, the, the uninvolved intellectual. And, you know, I, I think, I think, you, I think she, what she says there, and I agree with it, is that you can always answer these, you can only answer these questions locally. Right, and Foucault says this also, you know, you can only answer it locally. So I, I'm gonna stop now because I see other people in the chat. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, Lillian Barger has a, a question. She asked if you read the second sex in conversation with her memoirs and novels. Yes, I do. Um, I have I have two long readings of La Vite, for instance. Um, I don't really, you know, it started out, my book started out to just be about the second sex, but it's about the whole thing. Um, but um, I, I would say it's, um, I try to be aware of the different uh, pacts with readers that she makes in different genres. I think genre matters, you know, and, and I think, I think we have to also be particularly careful about taking the memoir as a key to the rest of it, you know, uh, or then even taking the unpublished writings, the letters as a key to the memoirs, you know, ev everything, um, Things deserve to be to be read in, in their in their own right. Um, I also talk a bit about the um, the novelistic aspect of the second sex. I, I don't know if that if that answers the question. Um, and that's also the. Um, uh, the the other thing that that thank you I, and yeah the other thing that Sarah mentioned about the phenomenological aspect of it um, that overlaps a lot with the narrative and the fictional. Go ahead, Maureen. Sorry. Oh no, no, it's okay. I was uh, going to ask Lillian if um, if that answers, uh, yes, she said that's good. And she has another question, so I'm, I'm gonna ask it. Um, also, she's wondering how Beauvoir intersects with transgender and how who she, would she respond? She, do you write about this in your book? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't write about it. I, I, I list it somewhere um, as something that I think people would want to take up, other people might want to take up. There's a, um, I know people are working on this. There's a lot to say uh, about the biology chapter. Uh, I know that uh, Alexander uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his last name is working on that. I think I think people are I think people are are, are working on this and it's very interesting. I, she was sympathetic to uh, trans people that she knew. Uh, there were just a, a very few passages about this here and there. but you know it's it's um, it's kind of impossible to know. Um, This is such a different world now that what she would say if she was here would be informed by the world now. Um, so I guess I would rephrase the, the question and say, what does she say anything that would be a resource for people thinking about that now? Because, um, you know, the world of gender, the sex gender system now is not the sex gender system of 1947 or of 1970 or, you know, the, the yeah. So I can't answer the question, but I think it's an interesting question for people to pursue. Um, let's take Kate. Kate's question. She asks, um, could you say more about the hermeneutics of disapproval? Do you think progress narratives in feminism perpetuate this? And if so, what kind of hermeneutics do you think we should aim to cultivate? Uh, is that Kate Kirkpatrick? Yeah. 
it's, yeah. sorry, it's cater. Yeah. Her, her, <laughs> hermeneutics, uh, yeah. Am I allowed to use that word to uh, someone who comes out of religious studies? Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, I think to, to some extent, there are different ways of reading and there are different projects. And it's not necessarily that one project is better than another one, um, but they're different projects. So, um, so there's a certain sort of philosophical inquiry where you take a short thing from Plato or whoever, and you think about it for five years, right? And then there's another thing uh, where you try to look at larger holes, holes with a W. And uh, I think to some extent, people just have different projects. You know, I think if someone's, um, my project is to, was to do the best I could to understand what Beauvoir was saying, but that doesn't have to be everybody's project. You know, for, for other people, things are more urgent. Um, I think there's a, uh, I talk a little bit uh, here and there about um, what you do when you're reading something and you're reading along and then the text kind of kicks you in the stomach somehow and says to you, you don't belong here. You're not the reader of this text. You know, the, the thing that, that Maria Lugones talks about when she says she has to go through contortions to find herself in a philosophical text. Um, and, um, you know, we can't, it, it, what, what used to be called uh, the resisting reader, right? And that's like the inaugural gesture of feminist reading. We can't do without that. You know, you can't do without the, wait a minute, I'm not here. Wait a minute, you forgot me. Uh, wait a minute, you just said something that insults me and my family. Um, and it's very important to, um, you know, that's really important. That it's a lot of the second sex is that, right? It's a compendium of all the stupid sexist things men have said from, you know, Plato to uh, Moriac, right? Um, so it's important to, to be doing that. Um, I, I think if we get to a place where if we get to a place where there comes to be almost a template for doing that, then that can be uh, a sign that it's hard to think anything new. But, you know, people, people have different projects. People have different readings. You know, I, I don't think I, I don't think I know what the um, and the progress narrative too, I see your qu question, you know, um, if there is no such thing as, as progress, uh, what do we, we have to think that there is. The, the, the difficulty is when there's progress in feminist theory to the point where people are saying, oh, that's an old way of talking about it. But the problem hasn't changed, you know? <laughs> we have different ways of talking about, you know, sexual violence or whatever, but it's still there, right? Whether, whether we tell each other that the way we're talking about it is outdated or not. So I guess that my answer here is also, I don't know. I'll be interested to see what you think about it. Thank you. Kate, would you like to say something? Maybe not. Well, I, I would like to think about what Meryl said first. <laughs> That's all right, but thank you, first of all. So. Thanks. Um, I forgot to ask Paul K. Smith questions, I'm sorry. Uh, he asks, how did Simone de Beauvoir respond to Jean Genet 
1947 play The Maids and the execution by a servant of her mistress, which inspired Jeanette's work. And Judy responded, uh, there's good material in Mary's book on Jeanette and Beauvoir's interest in violence. I cannot answer your question, but I think that you would find the book very helpful. Maybe, Meryl, you would like to add something? I don't think I say very much about it. Um, or maybe I've, maybe I've forgotten. Um, there, there would be a lot more to explore there. What she does, to, what she talks about in her memoirs is that I remember is not Janae's play, but the actual court case. No, I'm sorry, I'm mixing it up. But there, there yeah, I'm, I'm, but she mentions uh, in, in the memoir, she mentions various scandals and, and that's one. Um, but, the, but, the, but, and no, I do remember what, what she says about it. She says, um, she, she says some nasty things about the mistress. Is, am, am I right? Other people here know probably more, but she, she sees it as a class as a class crime, I, th I think. Um, but what she thought about the play, I'm not sure. Now I want to know. Thanks. And Judy and Sonia, if you, if at any time you want to speak up, just feel free to, to speak. Uh, Christine Batterspy have a, has a question. She is particularly interested in chapter four uh, and she thanks Judith for her introduction to it. Uh, does Meryl have anything to say about Beauvoir's relation to Dubois on double consciousness and race? And Judy says, yes, she does. I didn't even begin to summarize everything in that chapter, but yes, Dubois felt right and on to Fanon. Via right. Through right. Yeah, yeah. via right. Through, yeah. That's a very hard chapter to summarize. It really, you, you really have to, you really have to read it. But yes. The the other thing that the voice I is there. The other thing that I found out while I was researching this that was really interesting to think about was um, how much Wright cared about psychoanalysis, you know, and, and how, um, and obviously Fanon also did. And um, so that was uh, some of the contextualizing that I did there, but um, it, it, was, it was also, um, you know, Wright is just so interesting too, because, um, He, he had a, um, he saw what he was doing as psychology to an important degree. Um, and so that's a confluence that I see between him and, and Beauvoir and also Fanon with the difference that Beauvoir didn't think that she could cure anybody. She's she's very skeptical of the idea that that you can that you can um, have a psychological cure, uh, and she's very skeptical of the American tendency to um, to think that everyone needs to be better adjusted and be happy and be psychoanalyzed so that they're okay. She sees that as a kind of conformism. So thank you, Jen, you, you, uh, for giving the, um, the reference to Alexander's uh, article on trans in the, in the chat um, and the other things. Um, there's another question from Christine Battersby. Um, she says that she knows you said to her in an email that you had cut out material on surrealism. Is there anything that you would like to add about it now? 
Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a whole, um, you know, something that there needs to be more work done on, um, although maybe not by me, or, or that it would be helpful, I think, if more people would think about is um, Beauvoir's literary influences and then how she fits. So, um, so in, the, in, the, in the Blackwell's Companion, um, there is an article by me called Beauvoir as Literary Writer. Um, and I was given, you know, about this much space uh, to talk about everything that had to do with that. <laughs> um, but there's really um, a lot of uh, there's just a lot more to see in terms of um, and I know Toro Moy has worked on this also, but the the um, in terms of where she fits in the traditional picture of 20th century French fiction writing. And, um, and whether the, um, you know, whether, whether taking realist writers seriously, like Beauvoir and Sartre seriously, um, might reconfigure some of the, uh, I'm hesitating because I started to say the way French literature is taught, but of course I haven't had much to do with that for several decades. So there may be, there may be people, there may be people here who know, who know more about that. Um, but, but I think the, I think, um, so I, but I think the, um, well, you and I've talked about this a little bit, Christine, but I think the, um, the, the binary between um, avant-garde writing and realist writing or modernism and not modernism, I think it's too simple. I think there's an awful lot to, to know about it. Um, yeah, but we, we'll talk more about it. I know we'll talk more about it outside. Thanks. Um, I will go back to Sylvia Duverger's question after, but Aya Nakamura's question seems a good transition with Christine's. She says, thank you. I'm very moved by your comments on the importance of interdisciplinarity in Beauvoir's work. And she asks, do you discuss in your book Beauvoir's references to literary sources in the second sex? I talk about some of it. <clears throat> There's much more to talk about than, than, than I could talk about. But um, I certainly argue that her reference to literary sources is doing a lot of conceptual work in that book. It's not decoration or illustration. So for instance, she has some very slight, so the, the chapters on, the, on myth in five authors and the myth part generally, um, there's, that's, that's a section that a lot of people often skip because it's about people that, you know, who even are these people. But for instance, when she talks about Claudel, she doesn't have a lot to say about him, but um, she's doing a lot of political work by slamming him and Montalant also, you know, and, and this is part of the um, you know, the, the, what Sonia was talking about as her, her politics that isn't just feminist politics. A lot of that is carried out by um, the judgments she makes between various writers um, and in, in ways that, um, you know, 
uh, partially cut a lot of that stuff out because Americans wouldn't understand it. And it's true, maybe, but, um, but it, it um, is a somewhat unhelpful thing. That said, though, I would also say that if she found a good story that she wanted to use, she would use it without caring whether it was fictional or uh, historical or true, or even whether um, the person who wrote it was someone she hated for other reasons, right? So um, especially in, in connection with uh, the frigidity issue, you know, or with the unhappy women who are unhappy in their marriages. She pulls stories from everywhere and she doesn't uh, flatten out. She doesn't say, okay, these are case histories and these are novels. And this is uh, something that happened to my friend Zaza. She is just like, and this happened. And this, this is another of the excess that Sarah was talking about. Oh, and this happened. And then this happened. And then it happened again to somebody else. And oh, this happened. And that happened, you know? And, and uh, yeah, so, so I think, um, you know, literature is doing a, a lot of work um, in, in terms of exploring I don't know if you want to call this phenomenological or not, but exploring various dimensions of subjectivity that it's not easy to explore in other ways. Um, I think we can take two more questions. Um, Sylvia Duverger asks, um, is there in Beauvoir in Time an analysis of what Lacan did and much more, more did not of Beauvoir's developments about female sexuality in the second sex? Or is there anything about what Beauvoir was thinking of encore by Lacan? And did she ever answer to what seems to me, so to Sylvia, his provocations? Well, there's a little bit. Um, where Lacan comes, comes up in, in my book um, is in, kind of through the back door because it, I talk about Fanon for a long time and I talk about um, a Swiss psychoanalyst, Germaine Gueux, who was very important to Fanon and, um, and who actually seems very good and interesting to me, unlike Steckel, um, and like worth knowing more about. Um, and there was not much uptake of her work in France because, uh, because Lacan hated it. And that's sort of the, the um, that's the most I can I can say for it. Um, you know, I think Lacan wasn't Lacan yet when the second sex was written. Okay, you're frozen. Okay, you're unfrozen. Sorry, did that come through? Yeah. Yeah. C can you hear me? I have big problems with my Wi-Fi. Yes, I I, he I hear you. We can hear you. Okay. okay. So did did my answer to the question come through? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the, but the thing is, Lacan. You know, um, I don't think she really. I, I don't think she really answered back to him some of the way ever, some of the things that he said and did that were in a different direction. But here is something odd. Uh, when, when you get to the place in the memoir, in her memoirs, where they're protesting the actions of the French government with respect to Algeria, all of these people 
are together at the demonstrations. You know, all of these people that in the Spark Notes version of French intellectual history are supposed to be enemies. They're all, you know, uh, oh, we met in Foucault's apartment and Lacan was there and, and Sylvia. And, and, you know, um, that's kind of an eye opener to me. There's a, there's a picture of, um, there's a photograph of Sartre <coughs> and Foucault together um, in front of a, uh, it's some kind of a strike, uh, some kind of a, a union thing. Um, and they're both smiling. Foucault is smiling in this picture, you know? Um, so, so I think, uh, you know, we, we uh, Judy talked about this a little bit. You know, we tend to put these people like we're taking an exam on it and it's this one, this one's ideas versus that one's ideas and whose ideas were first. And, you know, um, but I, you know, I don't have maybe as much to say about this as I, about Lacan as, as, as I, as I ought to. I will say that there's a book, uh, David Macy's book, Lacan in Contexts, um, is a book that I found very helpful and um, what he did there was kind of what I was trying to do, you know, to, to fill in the, to fill in the gaps around the ideas. Who, 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 who was this person arguing against and why? Um, that's, that's really the best I can do with it. Thank you, Meryl. And uh, there's a question very um, public, and it's it's a current matter, from a Kanshka, a Kansha, sorry, Shola. How do we or do we separate figures whose work we respect and pioneer with their personal lives in a Me Too world where it's important to hold Woody Allen's accountable? I'm thinking of the accusations against Beauvoir about mis misconduct against minors and her consequent suspension. What do we do, if anything, with that? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a question that comes up. Um, I think there are people who can't watch a Woody Allen film now because it makes them feel nauseous. And I think there may be some people who feel that way. Well, you know, I think people have the, if people have a visceral response, then that is their response. Um, I think, I, so I talk about this, I talk about that incident um, in the, in the uh, I think it's in chapter two. Um, you know, um, that's definitely something that, um, you, so, and what she said about it later herself was, um, and Nelson Algren asked her about it or somehow it came up. Um, and she said to him, her English wasn't great. She said to him, I happened to behave very badly. You know, um, I guess one thing, you know, I can't answer this question for everybody. Uh, for, my, for myself, I think, um, anyone who has never done something that they regret is is in a good position to be censorious. Um, you know, people have to decide for themselves whether it outweighs, whether that blocks. What I was talking about, you know, when a when a text um, kicks you in the stomach, um, and and and. Um, but it's like one thing in that text. How do you know whether that one thing 
is the deal breaker. <sighs> you know, like how many examples of that one thing do there need to be? I, I don't know how to answer this question. It's a methodological question in a certain way. I, I don't mean to, to, to push aside the, the um, sort of emotional um, weight of, of your question, but you know, it's a methodological question. So, um, and you know, um, women writers are often treated as though their biography was more interesting and more important than their ideas. So there's that. You know, there, there's that kind of me too, also. There's the, um, I wanted to do some philosophy and people just wanted to talk about my sex life, me too. I don't know if anyone here has experienced that. Um, yeah, I don't, have a, I don't have a very good answer for any of these questions. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, I'm the, I'm the kind of teacher that always ends the hour a few minutes late saying, well, but it's really more complicated than that. Um, and that's the kind of book this is too. So caveat emptor, right? Yeah, but that's what makes it very interesting. So, and we have a very last question from Lillian Barger, and I think it echoes Kate Kirk Kirkpatrick's question. Um, she asks in a di direct message to me, didn't Beauvoir have a, a Galian view of history which implies progress, the world spirit becoming? Yes. I'm gonna write that question on the chat box for everyone. Yes. Um... She did, yes. Um, that that doesn't mean that she accepted everything that he said about what that progress would look like. Um, I've I've written about this in another place, actually, um, and and I really uh, tried hard to not let Hegel into the book very much, because when you let Hegel in. Um, you know, all of a sudden, nobody can understand anybody else. And it's a, it's a, uh, what I want to say about her use of, of Hegel is that it was strategic and it was partial. And she brings him up uh, when he's helpful. And when he's not helpful, she tells him to go away. Um, and she does, she does quite explicitly argue against the idea of, of progress in, um, the Hegelian idea of the triumph of the end of history and all of that when she, when she's talking about the you know the Nazis and the occupation, um, I she doesn't um, she doesn't take on board in the history chapters of the second sex. She doesn't follow his lead in terms of what's of the of what's better and what needs to go and um and this is something that um i want to look at more later because um A dig one digression that didn't make its way into this book had to do with Herodotus um, and, 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 and with um, what kind of history she's doing there and what she's making of his examples and his, um, yeah. But, but I think, you know, people who think that they're not being Hegelian are, are being Hegelian too, often. It's, it's very, so the, the classic example of this is Kristeva's Women's Time, where um, she, uh, she talks about how there are, how, how the, the Hegelian, well, I'm gonna butcher it now, but basically she says, oh, those people, they're so outdated, they're so Hegelian. Well, 
Whereas now we are doing this other thing, but that's, you know, progress too. You know, it's like you can't get your tail out of your mouth. You, you can't, um, there are certain, there are certain ideas about progress that, um, well, I don't know. Um, I guess people, I guess people do. But if you want to say, um, this is a political movement, things are not good, they should be better. Let's look at how we get from here to there. How can you do that without making value judgments and talking about progress? You, you have to, I think. Um, and, uh, and, you know, on some level, you, one has to make value judgments. What Beauvoir says about this is, is that there shouldn't be recipe for it. You know, and she also says that we should make our own value judgments and not think that um, someone else will tell us those things. So that's the best I can do. Thank you so much, Meryl. Um, uh, maybe I'm going to let you and Judy and Sonia say your final words before we hear Gina's comment on the, the conversation. If you have any. <laughs> you know, I am, <laughs> Thank you. It's, I am it's just so lovely to see everyone. Over by the, by the wit um, um, of the questions and the way that Meryl can respond. Virtually everything, yes, it's there, yes, it's in the book in, in one way or another. I, again, I mean, this is just an incredibly wide, rich book. Um, and I think the, the range of questions that's inciting and the way that Meryl can respond to them just really reiterates that. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that completely. And thank you. Marine and thank you, Gina. And uh, I know it is really too bad not to be able to see each other in person, but if this were in person, we wouldn't get to see even a quarter of this many people. So I do find that a consolation. And thank you all for, uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah. So oh, thank you to the three of you for this fascinating conversation. We, we all agree that uh, Beauvoir is still relevant today in the Mara's book. Uh, Meryl has done a meticulous um, and precious work in her book to, to show it. Um, thank you also to the audience for your questions and interest. Um, don't leave yet. Let's listen to my dear friend Gina. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, Gina, um, who will uh, comment on the sessions and conclude and conclude the session, and she will make a few announcements. Uh, Gina is a philosophy faculty member of the, at the University of Santo Tomas, uh, Philippines. Her areas are of interest include feminist philosophy, gender and development, um, existentialism. She wrote her dissertation, her PhD dissertation on Simone de Beauvoir's existentialist feminism, a critical reading of the Philippine Magna Carta of women. And she's also the core organizer of the Beauvoir webinar series and a member of the International Simone de Beauvoir uh, Society. So um, Gina, we are ready to listen to what you have to say about all of this. Thank you, Maureen. Good evening from the Philippines. It's my honor to, uh, to give a commentary, more like uh, concluding uh, remarks for this wonderful session of the International Simone de Beauvoir Society's Simone de Beauvoir webinar series, part three featuring Dr. Meryl Altman, Altman's uh, Beauvoir in Time. So um, yeah, first of all, uh, may I just say that to be part of this panel of esteemed Beauvoir scholars is such an honor for someone like me who once upon a time, as a struggling philosophy student doing her dissertation as mentioned by by uh, Marine 
on um, Beauvoir's existentialist feminism, using it to critically read the Magna Carta of woman, the so-called uh, Bill of Rights of the Filipino woman, have crossed paths with the works of Dr. Mariel Altman and Dr. Sonia Crooks, and had the privilege to meet and uh, listen to today. Uh, Dr. Judith Coffin's work, uh, I'm embarrassed to admit, particularly her recently published work titled Sex, Love, and Letters, Writing Simone de Beauvoir, which was featured during the first session of this webinar series, is a recent acquaintance I am excited to likewise read. While the physical book and Judith's notes um, are yet to reach me, uh, I managed to listen to her interviews which she talked where she talked about the book. So if you're interested in reading recent works of Beauvoir's uh, par particularly re relevant to her letters, this is a book to purchase. Secondly, the discussion today has covered a great deal of Beauvoir's thoughts. A critical study of the thought of Beauvoir requires a solid framework in order to have an accurate and potentially a definitive diagnosis of the analysis. Merrill's work um, critically uh, definitely uh, provides not only a diagnosis of what Beauvoir in her travels um, and what, he, what she identified to be the culprits of the unfortunate condition of the woman and more, even more, Merrill also presents a, a prognosis, particularly as it says in the book description, as she takes up three aspects of Beauvoir's work more recent feminists find embarrassing. Bad sex, dated views about lesbians and intersections with race and class. I say there is a prognosis done in the work, prognosis in the context of having to reaffirm the relevance of Beauvoir, especially in the present time, and certainly prognosis in the sense of having to forecast a potentially significant contribution of these thoughts across generations and cultures. By looking at the contents of the book alone, as I'm also yet to have my own copy of the book, I understood the importance of locating Beauvoir in various contexts, in various time. So mentioned by Sonia earlier were um, the chapters of the book, uh, Unhappy Bodies, The Frigid Woman in the Second Sex, Simone de Beauvoir and Lesbian Lived Experience, this being the same title of the work Mariel Altman gave for a 2007 work, which I also, I also cited in my dissertation. Nothing to say about race and class, uh, Beauvoir and Blackness, the East is real Orientalism and its enemies, and Beauvoir in China. If one knows Beauvoir's works, one can certainly not deny how manifest these works are in these mentioned contexts. Since 1949, The Second Sex, which I was able to read through the translation of Constance Walde, remains to find its place in the conditions of the society that also remains to be present uh, in the unfortunate situation or condition of the woman. In The Second Sex, Beauvoir, as resonated in the works of Mariel, Sonia, and Judith, exposed discussions that are deemed most relevant to many women's this, uh, situation or conditions hitherto. Further, Sonia Crooks in her 2012 book, Simone de Beauvoir and the Politics of Ambiguity, the second sex, uh, he, she says, reveals women's lived experience to her readers, evoking the experience of becoming a woman and capturing this experience in both its local heterogeneity and its ubiquity. It has extremely made an influence in the sphere of women liberation and women's studies, among others. In the 60s, Beauvoir was seen as a theoretician par excellence on the con condition of women, wrote Francis and Gontier in, their, in her biography. In the United States, they continued to publish the second sex in paperback, proving its reputation as the Bible of feminism. In the Philippines and certainly some parts of Asia, it has proven its acceptance, its readership and interest has also manifest in the participation of many Filipinos in the past three sessions of this webinar series. Some references claim that the analysis of Beauvoir's work was singularly understood in the philosophical milieu, yet her works, as also mentioned, are blatantly encompassed in literature, history, politics, and in, in 
interdisciplinarity aspects as the multidisciplinary Beauvoir scholars have been proving through the years. It is without a doubt that since 1949, more and more women and men have taken part in the struggle in order for the woman to genuinely perfect her project or their projects of transcendence, something Beauvoir also emphasized in her existentialist feminism. Coupled with situated freedom, what uh, Sonia Crooks defined as embodied consciousness, a socially situated and conditioned freedom, I argued in my 2016 paper that reciprocal recognition is a necessary element for a woman to achieve um, in to achieve transcendence. Situated freedom is essential in molding the independent woman, as defined by Beauvoir in the second sex, to have transcended beyond immanence, as it is a prerequisite to reciprocity, and the society plays a major role. Further, Situated freedom in the pursuit of transcendence is inoperable without society's reciprocal recognition. Reciprocal recognition is the role of society in the woman's pursuit of transcendence. It is in this condition in which each individual freedom recognizes the other that Beauvoir concluded that only in this way can the human being be most authentic in the context of her or his relationships with others. It is this society's positive response to woman's initiated attempt to change the status quo in a patriarchal society that is affirmed in the works and endeavors of, um, of many women and men all over the world. And also the re positive response of the male respondents in this session, which may imply recognition of that necessary reciprocal recognition I've been talking about. It is on this note that I would also wish to share that in the Philippines, we pose it that there is a gender turn in the philosophical discourses um, in a country. And uh, Dr. J.J. Joaquin and Dr. Hazel Diana, my colleagues in the Philosophical Association of the Philippines, and I argue for what we call a gender turn in the philosophical discourses in the country. This turn is evidenced by a steady, steadily increasing number of gender-related themes found in locally produced philosophy journal articles, conference papers, and other types of academic discourses since the 1950s and even before that. Uh, that pivot to gender is also seen in the recent activities of the Philosophical Association of the Philippines, the country's internationally recognized professional organization of philosophy, which I and other three women among nine, among, among nine are board members of, the first since its inception in 1973. And this is something I find uh, uh, significant. Also, the founding in the founding in 2020 of a group called Women Doing Philosophy, a group of women academics in the Philippines, uh, particularly teaching philosophy. Add to this uh, the continuing and widespread endeavor of some government agencies and private institutions to re-educate the population on gender and, and development. Maureen and I were able to be part of, to work together on one GAD activity uh, of one university in the country last 2020. This participation and other possible endeavors I intend to take part of while I can root from the influence uh, of Beauvoir's works. And having listened to our speakers today once again rejuvenates this spirit of keeping the, the fire burning. This is also how I would exactly describe Merrill's work, a touchstone that possesses a refreshing spirit in showing that Beauvoir is still good to think with today. And as she said, to keep pushing forward in the spirit of intellectual curiosity and beyond. And so we continue on with this project or projects and ha we have Simone de Beauvoir to thank for her groundbreaking works and thoughts and the scholars like Meryl, Judith and Sonia and others to also be grateful to for continuing her legacies. Uh, with this, um, I would like to say maraming salamat, uh, merci beaucoup and thank you very much for taking part of this project. Before we end the session tonight, today, or this afternoon, allow me to give a few announcements. 
from the organizers first. The next session will be a special session featuring the works published or to be published in the Simone de Beauvoir studies on the theme translating and reading the second sex. This will be co-organized with the Simone de Beauvoir studies a peer-reviewed multidisciplinary journal dedicated to advancing scholarship and themes relevant to Beauvoir's legacy. Please watch out for the final details. Second, uh, to receive updates, please like our social media page, um, the Simone de Beauvoir, um, the International Simone de Beauvoir Facebook, uh, Society Facebook page. Uh, the link is right there. It's easy to locate it. Please just search for the International Simone de Beauvoir society. You may also find updates, uh, previous webinar sessions, uh, uh, and other society news in our website. That's the website right there of the society. Okay, and finally, for those who wish to receive um, certificates or e-certificate for the session tonight or for today, please fill out the evaluation form through that link which you now find in the chat box. We are giving you um, an hour, please, to fill out the evaluation form and let us know what you think about the session today. So, um, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a productive uh, time. Uh, we once again thank you all for being part of the third session of the Simone de Beauvoir webinar series brought to you by the International Simone de Beauvoir Society in partnership with the Department of Philosophy of the University of Santo Tomas and from ESPA, University of Toulouse. Thank you very much. So on that note, um, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good night, uh, fellow Filipinos. It's almost midnight here until the next session. Thank you once again and see you next time. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Thank you, Gina.